Joe O'Reilly, didn't have a last meal wish. Maybe he didn't quite get what that meant. He was just 23, with an IQ of 46. He understood the simple joys of eating, playing, and the world of trains, things you could see, smell, and live. But things like God, justice, and evil, were like elusive dreams to him. The doctors called him an imbecile, a term for someone who thinks like a child, between the ages of four and six. When the police pressured him into confessing, to a gruesome murder he didn't commit, his short life, met a tragic end. This is the heartbreaking story of Joe Aridi, one of those instances when justice went awry. Joe Aridi, was born in 1915, in Pueblo, Colorado. The oldest child of Mary and Henry Aridi, who had recently moved from Syria. They were first cousins and didn't speak English. For the first five years of his life, Joe didn't talk. After going to elementary school for just one year, his principal told his parents to keep him at home, saying he could not learn, or understand. When he was 10, he went to the state home, and training school for mental defectives, in Grand Junction, Colorado. Where he lived on and off for 11 years, until becoming a young adult. Examiners at the home, also had Aridi's family, undergo several psychological tests, and concluded that his mother, Mary, was probably feeble-minded. Both in his neighborhood, and at the school, he was often mistreated and beaten, by other kids. In 1929, while living back in Pueblo, Aridi was sexually assaulted, by a group of teenage boys, aggravating his mental issues. Eventually, he left the school, and hopped on freight rail cars, to leave the city, ending up at the age of 21, in the rail yards, of Cheyenne, Wyoming, by late August, 1936. On the night of August 15, 1936, Dorothy Drain's parents, returned to their Pueblo, Colorado home. Only to discover their 15-year-old daughter, lifeless in a pool of her own blood. A fatal blow to the head, had taken her life while she slept. Tragically, her younger sister, Barbara, also suffered a head injury, but miraculously, survived. The vicious attack sent shockwaves through the town, prompting newspapers to sensationalize the situation, declaring the presence of a sex-motivated murderer, on the loose. Police were under tremendous pressure, to catch the killer, and Sheriff, George Carroll, must have felt nothing but relief. When 21-year-old, Joe Aridi, who had been found aimlessly wandering, near the local rail yards, confessed to the murders. On August 26, 1936, Aridi, was arrested for vagrancy, in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Although the crime occurred in Colorado, the local sheriff, George Carroll, was aware of the widespread search for suspects, in the Drain murder case. When Aridi disclosed during questioning, that he had traveled through Pueblo by train, after departing from Grand Junction, Colorado, Carroll began to interrogate him about the Drain case. Carroll claimed that Aridi confessed to him. Witness accounts, indicated that the individual in close proximity, to the crime scene, bore a Mexican appearance. It is noteworthy, that Joe Aridi's parents were Syrian immigrants, a detail contributing to his dark complexion. When Carroll contacted the Pueblo police chief, Arthur Grady, about Aridi, he learned that they had already arrested a man, considered to be the prime suspect, Frank Aguilar, a laborer with the Works Progress Administration, from Mexico. Frank, had worked for the father of the Drain Girls, and been fired shortly before the attack. An axe head was recovered from Aguilar's home. Sheriff Carroll, claimed that Aridi, told him several times, he had been with a man named Frank, at the crime scene. Frank later confessed to the crime, and emphatically told police, he had never seen or met Aridi. Frank Aguilar, was convicted of the rape and murder, of Dorothy Drain, and sentenced to death. He was executed on August 13, 1937, in the Colorado State Penitentiary. After being transported to Pueblo, Aridi reportedly confessed again. Aridi spoke slowly, struggled with tasks like identifying colors, and had difficulty repeating sentences longer, than a couple of words. The superintendent of the state home where Aridi lived, remembered him being easily manipulated by other boys. 
they once convinced him to confess to stealing cigarettes, even though it was impossible for him to do so. Sheriff Carroll seemed to grasp her idea's susceptibility to influence, similar to how other boys had taken advantage of him before. Carol's questioning approach involved leading questions, like asking about Aridi's interest in girls, and immediately suggesting wrongdoing, if you like girls so much, why do you hurt them? The coercive nature of these questions led to swift changes in his testimony, depending on the interrogator. Moreover, Aridi remained unaware of key details of the murders, such as the weapon being an axe, until they were presented to him during questioning. During the trial, Aridi's lawyer argued that his client was not mentally fit, hoping to spare his life. Despite being deemed sane, three state psychiatrists acknowledged Aridi's severe mental limitations, classifying him as an imbecile, based on the medical terminology of that time. They pointed out his IQ of 46, equivalent to that of a six-year-old, and emphasized his incapacity to distinguish between right and wrong, making him unable to engage in actions with criminal intent. Aridi was convicted largely due to his false confession, a vulnerability often observed in individuals with limited mental capacity during interrogations. Notably, there was no physical evidence against him. Barbara Drain's testimony implicated Aguilar in the attack, not Aridi, as she could identify Aguilar due to his prior work for her father. Despite the weakness of the evidence, Aridi was found guilty and sentenced to death. Attorney, Gail L. Ireland, who later was elected and served as Attorney General and Water Commissioner, became involved as defense counsel in Aridi's case after his conviction and sentencing. While Ireland won several delays of Aridi's execution, he was unable to get his conviction overturned or commutation of his sentence. While awaiting appeals on death row, Aridi found solace in playing with a toy train, a thoughtful gift from prison warden, Roy Best. According to Best, Aridi was considered the happiest prisoner on death row. Both fellow inmates and guards treated him well. Warden Best became a strong supporter of Aridi, actively contributing to efforts to spare his life. Their bond was profound, with Best caring for Aridi, like a son, regularly bringing him gifts. In reflecting on Aridi's demeanor, before the execution, Best remarked, he probably didn't even know he was about to die, all he did was happily sit and play with the toy train I had given him. For his last meal, Aridi requested ice cream. When confronted about his impending execution, he displayed a blank bewilderment. Before being taken to the gas chamber, Aridi hadn't quite finished his ice cream. He wanted the rest refrigerated thinking he could enjoy it later, and aware that he wouldn't be coming back. As he was led to the gas chamber, reports say he smiled. Though a bit nervous initially, he found solace when the warden grabbed his hand, and reassured him. The execution happened fairly quickly, but it's said that warden best, shed some tears in the chamber. Joe Aridi, was just 23 years old, when he was executed on January 6, 1939. In 2011, Aridi received a full and unconditional posthumous pardon by Governor Bill Ritter, 72 years after his death. Ritter, the former district attorney of Denver, pardoned Aridi based on questions about the man's guilt and what appeared to be a coerced false confession. This was the first time in Colorado that the governor had pardoned a convict after execution. Author Robert Persky on the left and attorney David Martinez who won a posthumous pardon for Joe Aridi in 2011. They visit Joe's grave on Woodbecker Hill, outside of Cannon City, Colorado. Thank you for watching.